This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. A certain little boy there was who got mad at his older brother and ran into the house to complain to his father. He said, he isn't being very nice to me today. He isn't any fun to be with at all. I don't even want to be his brother anymore. And the father replied, you don't have to play with him. You don't even have to talk to him. But you do have to be his brother because you are. And thus it is with all of humankind. We may not all be neighbors, but we do all have to be brothers because we simply are. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said, You are all brothers, and one is your Father which is in heaven. Said Jesus, My peace I give to you. Peace be upon you. There are many wondering what sort of difference the teachings of Jesus could make in this tempestuous world. They can make magnificent changes. The teachings of Jesus can make this world different by making the men and women on this world different, who make up, who compose this very world. But humankind itself must first be changed. Imagine a materially perfect society, a veritable utopia of opulence and luxury. Imagine a world in which mechanization had been so perfected that the average man or woman needed only work one hour a day to live in splendid wealth and ease. Imagine a world in which every conceivable pleasure is at one's fingertips, where everybody is rich, machines do the work, each person lives in a palace that children are educated by ingesting intelligence pills. There are no depressions or stock market crashes. And by pushing a button, you can have any material thing that you desire. In the midst of all of that affluence, with all of that spare time and nothing else to do, unless humankind had progressed spiritually in its goodness and its love, people would become bored, peevish, petulant, argumentative, and within a few mere months, they would probably have begun to tear that ideal structure down. No, material progress is going to be empty and disillusioning unless with it and indeed in advance of it we first achieve spiritual progress, learning to live as brothers and sisters, members in one great spiritual family of God. Do you know the dictionary definition of an electric motor? It is, quote, a rotating device which transforms electrical energy into mechanical energy. And herein lies a vivid parallel. For a religious man or woman, similarly, is a person who transforms spiritual energy into mechanical energy. This is the difference which real religion can make in your daily life. For you, analogously, can transform spiritual energy into living power for the living of your life. Too many social reformers have missed this germane truth. They want to get people to behave in a different way, behave better without giving them the energy to do so. Imagine logging camp foremen who send their lumberjacks out into the cold morning to chop wood, but without any breakfast. And at noon, instead of lunch, the men are given an illustrated lecture on how to improve your woodcutting efficiency. Well, by afternoon, those men will not have the energy to chop trees. Far more important than knowing the technique of physical work is first the issue of having the strength to do that physical work. So, with changing this world, so with bringing world peace, we first need the spiritual energy for this sort of good and altruistic living before we can carry these things out. Personal experiential religion provides this very energy. The secular world provides the outlet. Many social reformers are like a man who goes to the wheel of an unplugged motor, gives it a vigorous turn, it revolves for a little while, but by his energy, not by its own. So many humanitarians have ended up turning people's motors by hand instead of plugging them into power. The business of real religion, the teachings of Jesus, is to energize human beings for powerful and good living, to be centers of peace, of love, of goodness, and progress. Sometimes even religious people can become most unbrotherly. Yet it is my conviction that humankind must face the future hand in hand, even if we don't see eye to eye. Because spiritual brotherhood is not only good for society in general and good for others, but it is also specifically, individually, good for you, yourself. There's an old Hindu proverb that goes, Help thy brothers boat across. And lo, thine own 
has reached the shore. Jesus said, give a cup of cold water to someone else, but do some simple, elemental act of service, of love, of compassion. And that is where a transformed world begins. Adlai Stevenson wrote in the Saturday Review not long before his death, quote, the world is now too dangerous for anything but the truth and too small for anything but brotherhood. If the two of us, just you and I, will begin to live our lives in this sort of brotherhood as children of the living God, this world will then begin to be transformed in a manner marvelous to behold. Helen Hayes, the actress, once wrote, Peace begins in our nurseries. The home is the basis for democracy and the cradle where it was born. Alfred C. Lane has said, one can take a gun away from a drunk man, an insane man or a burglar, but taking away his gun does not make the drunk sober, the insane man sane, or the burglar philanthropic. It does not in itself promote a peaceful frame of mind. That must have its origin in the inner life. The desire for peace does not ensure it, said a friend to Ramsay MacDonald when he was Prime Minister of England. I know that's right, replied MacDonald. Neither does the desire for a meal, the desire for food, satisfy your hunger. But, he said, it does start you moving toward a restaurant. A changed world begins in changed attitudes, transformation of your inner life, learning to love, learning to forgive. If you're still holding grudges, resentments, hatreds, animosities toward your neighbor, toward your brother, toward somebody 15 or 20 years ago for something that happened long in your past, then you're part of the problem of this world, not part of the solution. Because the solution is love, it is forgiveness, it is mercy. It is letting bygones be bygones. Letting the love of God in your life so suffuse your consciousness that you become a center of peace, of the spiritual renaissance, of the brotherhood of man beneath the fatherhood of God, where you are, as you are. Edwin Markham wrote a poem. He drew a circle that shut me out. Heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Do not be demeaned and debased to the level of retaliatory hatred and animosity. Overcome it all by love. Jesus said, love your enemies. I say just for practice from time to time, let us try it out on our friends as well. Love is at the very heart of what Jesus of Nazareth taught. The Chinese have for centuries had a beautiful proverb. If there is righteousness in the heart, there will be beauty in the character. If there be beauty in the character, there will be harmony in the home. If there is harmony in the home, there will be order in the nation, and when there is order in the nation, there will be peace in the world. But you trace it all back, you trace it all back to the heart, the mind, the life, the attitude of the individual human being, the individual man or woman. That's you. That's me. It begins literally with us. James F. Burns, former Secretary of State of the United States, wrote, world peace depends upon what is in our hearts more than it depends upon what is in our treaties. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And he said, blessed are you when you hunger and thirst after righteousness, for you will be filled. He didn't just say, idly wish that you were good and righteous. He said, hunger for it, thirst for it, crave for goodness and righteousness, and you will be filled. He said, seek and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened. Ask, and you will receive. He said, it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. If a little boy or girl asks for bread, is hungry, will the father give that child a stone, a rock, as a mockery, as a jest? No, a loving parent will give that which the child needs. And the greatest need of the peoples of our planet in this hour is a rebirth of love, of peace within the heart. 
Do you know that every other hospital bed in the United States of America is occupied by someone with mental problems, with psychological distresses? Think of the ulcers, the hypertension, the heart problems, the early deaths simply from anger, from senses of revenge, from worry, remorse, regret. But 2,000 years ago, there came a charismatic carpenter proclaiming, you can achieve the mastery of all that because God can achieve the mastery of you, of your life and all that it contains if you will give your life to the living God who gave you your life in the first place. And love will win the victory. Love is peace. One of the earliest written documents, dated 3000 B.C., reads, Life is given to the peaceful and death is given to the guilty. The peaceful being he who does what is loved, the guilty he who does what is hated. When Mahatma Gandhi was nearly slain by a fanatic Muslim in 1908, he turned to his adherents and said, This man did not know what he was doing. I will love him, and I will win his love. One year later, this very same man against whom Gandhi refused to witness in court wrote a letter offering his apologies and his admiration. Love is power. In fact, love is the greatest power in the universe. Helen Toner has written, It is safe to say that no farmer ever got a corn crop by simply reassuring himself periodically, I'm not going to let my land grow up to weeds. Similarly, the people of the world can never hope to reap the benefits of permanent peace just by reassuring themselves daily, Well, we don't want to have any more war. Just as there is no corn crop without planting and cultivation, so there will be no growth toward peace on earth and goodwill among men without the planting and cultivation of the attitudes which breed peace on earth and goodwill among humankind. And that's where it comes right down to you, to this broadcast. You face this day a simple choice. Are you going to be part of the peace of this world or part of the agitation, the strife, the hatred, the vengeance? On which side are you going to stand? The God of this universe, who rules this entire vast universe by the very power of his love, calls you to live truly as the son or daughter of God you were born to be, and to bear ever in mind, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. May you be a center of peace, of light, of joy. Remember that when you face the light, the shadows will fall behind, and a transformed world begins with the transformation of human attitudes, and that can begin for you this very moment, right here and right now, if in faith you will have it so. And then write to us at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644 USA. That's the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, or abbreviate it, SRI, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644 USA. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, all this literature, yours with no cost, charge, or obligation. For those of you listening in other countries around the world, over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell the mailing address, Post Office Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.